Welcome to this lecture series about complex numbers. In this lecture, we'll be giving a motivation for the construction of complex numbers, the need for them. And we will also look at some prerequisites. All right, so let's start with natural numbers. Natural numbers are the numbers one, two, three, and so on. And they are denoted by the symbol, which is N with a small vertical bar accompanying on the left. And uh, I can't say much about them. We are familiar with how to add natural numbers, how to multiply natural numbers, and so on. Uh, once we have natural numbers, we can invent what is called the set of whole numbers, which is just natural numbers with an extra symbol zero. And again, I'm sure we are familiar with how zero behaves, what is the addition, what is the multiplication that is happening here. But then we notice a certain deficiency in either of them which is that equations of this form, x plus three, let's say, equals zero. These equations cannot be solved within any of these, you know, the, the bigger one even. There is no whole number which solves this equation. And this equation arises naturally out of, let's say, monetary considerations, or you could say physics considerations. You owe someone a sum of money, you could say you have negative money with you, or you could talk about positive or negative charges. So the set of whole numbers is not sufficient to account for all such equations and therefore we invent and I emphasize that we invent the set of integers and again I'm sure we are familiar with what are these numbers and how to add and multiply them okay but then again these are also not sufficient for a lot of purposes for example one cannot solve this equation within integers even though the coefficients are all integers there is no integer which satisfies this equation. And this equation also arises pretty naturally. Suppose you have a bag of salt and you want to divide that in two people equally and say it is one kg salt in it, then how many, uh, what is the weight of salt given to each person? So such equations arise naturally, but integers are insufficient to solve them. And therefore we invent rational numbers, which can be described in this way. It is numbers of this sort, where p is some integer and q is some non-zero integer. So this just means p is an integer. This symbol means p belongs to z. p belongs to z. z is the set of all integers. Okay, and this is a construction. So the formalism for it, uh, for it is something I don't want to get into. What exactly, you know, how exactly do you formally construct them? But I'm sure we are familiar with what are rational numbers from our high school experience. Okay, uh, but then again, these are even uh, the, even these are not uh, enough to take into account everything. For example, when cannot solve these algebraic equations, every such equation can be solved here, but these ones cannot be. And this is this arises out of geometry. If you have a right triangle whose legs are let's say one units then the length of the hypotenuse is the positive solution to this equation given by Pythagoras' theorem. And uh, there's a famous story that this was discovered by the Pythagoreans in ancient times, maybe 2,600 years ago, and somebody within them wanted to share this with the rest of the world. But then the Pythagoreans wanted to hide this. They somehow did not want other people to know about such, such uh, blasphemous things. And there's a story that that person was later drowned in the river or something like that. So there are some grave stories associated to this discovery. All right, to, to, to fix that, we invented real numbers. And this is a very sophisticated construction. Going from n to whole numbers, then from whole numbers to integers, and then from integers to rationals. These are fairly simple steps. But the construction of real numbers using rationals is a fairly advanced and sophisticated step. And we do not see that in high school, that is beyond the scope of high school mathematics, so we won't do that here. But still we have a feel for what real numbers are, so we just take them for granted. And you can solve this equation and many other equations in real numbers and things like, you know, root 2, root 3, they all exist in real numbers, pi and e and all these things. But even real numbers are insufficient in some way, and in what way? Uh, give me a second. Yeah, so real numbers cannot solve this equation. Very simple algebraic equation, but the real numbers cannot solve them. 
because any real number you fit in place of x, you get a positive real and therefore it cannot be zero. So again, one can invent complex numbers, which we will discuss explicitly in the next lecture, but one can invent something called complex numbers, which, can, which, which are an extension of real numbers. So in some way you can embed real numbers in complex numbers, just like you can embed not, uh, whole numbers in integers and integers in rationals. Similarly, there's an extension of real numbers called complex numbers in which you can solve this equation. But then this gives rise to a natural question. Do there exist algebraic equations which cannot be solved in complex numbers? Where does this process stop? Where does this uh, increasing complexity stop? And the answer is it, it stops here. And that's a celebrated theorem due to Gauss uh, called the fundamental theorem of algebra. The proof of it is again advanced and we cannot discuss this in a high school level course. So we will assume that uh, that particular theorem, but uh, for that first we need to discuss what is this, is this beast and that is the subject of the next lecture. So this is a motivation for the need for complex numbers. It just serves to solve some algebraic equations which weren't solvable within reals and magically it turns out that actually you can solve all algebraic equations in this new system. So this system in, is in that sense algebraically complete. Okay, uh, so again one can ask some questions of the, so of the sort like can I actually see a complex number? Is it, is it real in some sense? And I don't see much weight in those questions because you can ask, is, are these numbers real in some sense? And uh, one might say, well, of course, you can take two apples and that gives you, you know, a visual or a real world representation of the number which we see here. But if you put those two apples in a bag or a box, after an year, they become mushrooms. So you, you can't really faithfully realize any, any number here in the real world. Whatever example that comes to your mind will be subject to the non-ideal situation of the real world, the, the entropy of the real world or whatever you want to call it. So these numbers are themselves abstractions and something, some, something that, is, that is only present in the human brain. And so are these. These are very useful. They have applications in engineering, in computer science, in physics, in all branches of mathematics. So they offer a lot to the real world. But asking for a faithful real world representation of a complex number is perhaps not a, not a very good question to ask. Let me just put it that way. Um, so let's go to the prerequisites. One should be familiar with some basic trigonometry. For instance, one should be familiar with these formulas, sine of alpha plus beta is so and so and cos of alpha plus beta and so and so and so on and some basic coordinate geometry, like equation of a line, equation of a circle, those things. So that is more or less uh, the prerequisites. And I find the subject of complex numbers, the study of complex numbers quite fun. We, we, we will see many interesting applications to basic geometry. And uh, a lot of very interesting puzzles can be formulated, the kind of things that are asked in entrance examinations. We will, all, we will cover many of those. And with that, uh, I want to end this lecture. And I will see you next time.